Thanks, Pam and Babs, for that introduction. And thank you, all of you, for being here in this wonderful part of the world on a beautiful spring day. I couldn't really think of any better time to talk about woodland gardening than now in the last couple of weeks as the trees have expanded their leaves. If you've been able to get out botanizing at all, we're, we're, we've seen a lot of spring wildflowers. And you may, or I hope most of you know that the Southern Appalachians, part of this area, are one of the 10 most biodiverse regions on Earth. Think about that. We live in a special place here. Very, very special. And I hope to inspire you today if you, to continue your journey into replacing some of the non-native ornamentals you might have, or if you have open space to add more natives, to continue to make that journey towards what Doug Talmy is calling now the, our homegrown national parks. I love that concept. He's promoting 70% natives at least. He and his wife, if you've seen his presentations, have uh, live that and their Pennsylvania property going from uh, 10 acres of nothing to something that's very vibrant. So what I'll be doing today is really talking about many of our native trees, shrubs, wildflowers, and just the process of how to think about it. How many of you are totally fairly new to Western North Carolina? Pretty, pretty good number. How, how many of you have been here 10 years or more? So pretty good number. And so I, it, what's been is so interesting is as we learn more and more about our native plants and native both trees, shrubs, herbaceous plants, the more we can learn how to best incorporate them into our landscapes. Tim and I did not grow up as gardeners. We were plant ecologists. We were faced with our first house, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that and its transformation, or our second house, rather, in Clemson. So let me show you. Eastern deciduous woodlands stretch from down, you can see down here, then the southern Great Smoky Mountains in the southern part of the Appalachians, all the way up here, through. This, in general, all, wants to be various sorts of woodlands. There are pockets of grassy balds, rocky outcrops like that. Down on the coast, it's, it's different. But our forest communities are very diverse, but generally these four are, are probably the ones you may be more familiar with. Northern hardwood forests, oak hickory forests, the cove forests are the wonderful places like Pearson's Falls or Station Cove that have the really, really rich woodland wildflowers in their understories. Alluvial forests along the edge of rivers are very rich areas often. Some of you may have noticed, if I, I, I happen to have this epiphany driving along the French Broad the other day, is that Halesia, silver bells, line the edges of the French Broad. I'm kind of thinking, you know, did I never drive along here or walk along here before and notice these? You know, it's so obvious. And then we have a new greenway in Asheville on the French Broad down in the River Arts District. And I like to walk or bike there. And I'm like, oh, there's a Halesial here too on the far side. But wonderful plant to add to your, your landscapes. And you can just see how all these different vegetation types. And I mention this because knowing the plant communities in your areas is such a valuable way to inform what you might want to plant. Each one of you it's going to be, has a different sort of um, backdrop to do a, a woodland garden or a native woodland garden. This is one a little bit farther north, but you know, we think about tall hickories, oak trees, understory of, if, you, if it was, pH was neutral enough, it would be Virginia bluebells, you might have trout lilies, any number of wonderful things. Native azaleas are starting to flower now. I'm sure you've seen some of those. Um, so I hope some of you have 
familiarize yourself with Tim's book. It's in most of the libraries around these areas. His, his groups of plant communities have really helped a lot of folks think about looking at the landscape like a plant ecologist and just thinking about how to put some things together. I like to brag about Tim because he's been an absolutely fantastic gardener in the sense of creating these native plant vignettes because of the way that he understood these plant communities. This one happens to be the thumbnails from the Oak Hickory Forest and you can see there's a, thumbna a little thumbnail of uh, pignut hickory and looks like shagbark hickory in Cornus, Florida. That This has been such a fantastic dogwood year so far. I mean, it really has been fantastic. So a few more thumbnails, but just the idea that if you can figure out what kind of forest your landscape might be, whether it's small or large, or, or what you want to create, you can create these landscapes as well. So. So this is what I think of when I think of a spring woodland understory. Um, the ferns and the I didn't take that photograph, so I'm not sure what the purple plant is. It's probably a, a well, it doesn't really matter. Probably a phlox, but uh, um, native azaleas, wonderful places to to visit. Um, I'll just mention this. Um, Botanical Gardens at Asheville, if you haven't been there, I hope you all will go there, is a over, let's see, 60 year old small garden uh, uh, next to um, the UNCA campus, uh, all native plants. And they have a new garden director so who started this um, year. And they've had some real, it's a great place to go look at um, the the Botanical Gardens at Asheville, BGA. Uh, and and I, I would also put in a plug, if you are down towards the South Carolina Botanical Garden in Clemson, the, the Natural Garden Heritage Garden Trail features uh, two absolutely wonderful woodland garden um, areas. In fact, these were two of my, the signs I made for those. First, the Woodland Wildflower Garden, which was the older of the two gardens. Full, you know, March 10th, I, I put Coney Bells is in flower. Of course, they weren't native there. They were <coughs> transplanted there. Um, Christmas fern, foam flower, may apple, wild ginger, Adamasco lilies, um, Piedmont rhododendron. Just, just so many things that are out. Um, the Rich Cove Forest Garden was a created garden. We brought in um, higher pH soils to bring that, the pH up to more neutral, which then supports the Dutchman's Britches and yellow buckeyes and speckled wood lilies and lady slippers and that Carolina silver bell that I just mentioned. So, and just as an aside, a very famous, um, Native plant garden, the garden in the woods up in Framingham, Massachusetts. They, they created all of their native plant gardens by using oyster shells as an addition to get that pH of the soil in an old quarry site up. Now this sounds way too in labor intensive to con contemplate at this point, but you can indeed amend it. This garden looked beautiful by the time, I mean, by the time I left and really was, was a, a really attractive and I'm sure it's great this time of year. So I like to ask this question because we can really think about this on any, any scale, um, a larger scale, smaller scale, um, and depending on what you imagine, I, if you Google what kind of, you know, let's see, what did I try? C creating, my, the name of my title here, the Creating a Natural Woodland Garden. I Googled that yesterday. Various things popped up. It was really very interesting. Um, my idea is that of this is very much of a, a naturalistic, something that would seem fairly like nature, but is created. Um, this is, was what we looked out at in our Clemson landscape 
through into the front. And I'll just give you a quick snapshot of what we started with. <laughs> Can you imagine two plant ecologists arrive and the guy we bought the house from says, oh, I spend four hours on the mower every weekend. And we're like, <laughs> an old snapper? I don't think so. <laughs> So, so in, in the, you can see the line of red tips down there along the road were hideous and there were a few old oak trees that were very nice. Well, so we, Tim proceeded to, you can see these little trees he start, started to plant. We, I think we went to Walmart of all places and scrounged up some things we knew were native. But that was a long time ago. So that's what it became, started becoming, the transition. You, you probably heard about the leave the leaves, you know, we, we were adding leaves like crazy to get rid of the grass um, and provide enriched soil to, in fact, to start working on our woodland. So just another view. It didn't, it didn't actually take that long. We lived there for over 20 years. Um, and it really did feel like a woodland and we didn't see into the, the front. We did a similar thing in back to, I was talking with um, uh, one of you before the program about how we created a songbird hedge of mixed natives to buffer ourselves from all of our back neighbors. That was also the similar lawn all the way to the back and that kind of thing. So just a bit of snapshot there. And we did this ourselves, you know, of course we were younger then, but uh, they, <laughs> um, I always keep that in mind. But um, you can see how pretty, you know, you've, you add enough mixed things and layers. You're looking at, okay, how do I create a naturalistic garden that makes you feel sort of at home, a sense of place. Um, and you don't have to mow the lawn. <laughs> we did have to buy a lawnmower, but we were really happy to move to Asheville full time and get rid of the lawnmower. So, another view of a front. Now, one of the things we all have to consider as we work with our property or our landscape, I like to call our landscapes, our gardens, because we as gardeners, we actively garden, we create, that's the inspiration. We put in that imprint and um, calling it something more than your yard, it just seems to me to give it something, a more personal tone to it. So some of you may, um, you know, you start with a pre-existing woodland, um, gas, uh, or overgrown ornamentals, whether you're an in-town site or live somewhere in the, in the countryside, is the soil shallow? Has anything been planted there? I've gone to, um, to do site visits for all over these counties and in Asheville, and it's so variable as to what the situation might be. It may be an open pasture or lawn or a cleared new home site. You know, we have lots of new developments. Are, are some of you in a new development sort of situation? Just a couple, yeah. I see more people that have overgrown um, ornamentals, actually, in town. Um, you know, and we are also looking at, well, what's the invasive pressure? Um, we have a mix, so, you know, depending on where you are, there's a lot of different things that can be creeping in from all sorts of places. So you, we want to assess your site. Our, the goal here is to think about what's a natural native woodland with a canopy, mid-level, lower level. And if you want to try some of those native woodland wildflowers, you do have to create sort of organic, rich beds that support those. Um, I visited a, a person, person's landscape a couple of days ago where I saw something for the first time, and I'll just mention this briefly. It doesn't have to do with woodland wildflowers, but it has to do with plantings. She was having failure, and I, failure I should 
be nicer about that. Um, the, the, these plants were dying, not to her, because of her doing. They had all been installed by the landscaper pot bound. <laughs> they were pot bound. She hadn't been there. This is at an old um, home, beautiful old home place in Monford. The landscapers had done a beautiful job of laying out the beds. But I, I was walking, I was walking, a friend of, anyway, it doesn't matter, but I was walking with her and I'm looking, what is wrong with these plants? And she'd already pulled out four rotos. These little native azaleas looked awful. This little spireas looked awful. And then we went to the back and I said, I think I'd replace those. And she popped one up. The roots were exactly in the shape of a pot. So that is the first time, and I've been at this a long, long time um, in terms of in, uh, helping people learn about growing plants and native plants. But that's something to watch as if, you know, somewhere like Carolina and um, native nurseries where you're up potting frequently, you're not going to have pot bound plants because you up pot before they get pot bound. Or if they are pot bound, you really have to loosen up those roots. Um, similarly, with our smaller plants, whether they're woody or herbaceous, you also need to loosen up those roots. They, and these woodland wildflowers really need um, that rich soil too. So I mentioned the layers already, very simple concept. Um, generally starting with the largest trees and then working with the canopy trees with some sort of notion about how you're going to um, walk through that. Do you want access? Is it something you're looking at out of your window, out of your study window, out of your living room window? Is it your back garden? Do you need to be able to walk through it? That, um, so trees, shrubs, understory herbs could be last. And you don't actually have to um, plant a lot of understories. This, when we bought our house in Asheville, we bought it, one of the reasons was we walked into the house and saw the upper canopy of this ravine forest. <coughs> before we saw all the ivy and privet and honeysuckle, which, which is an old neighborhood in Asheville, just like old neighborhoods in this area, are full of these plants. Um, so that's another view a little bit farther across the ravine. Pretty awful, pretty awful. But fortunately, ivy is, relatively easy to remove if you're pretty strong. <laughs> and we bought this house in 2008, so happily um, we were a little, Tim was a, younger and much e more able to scramble up and down the slopes, but proceeded to get rid of these things, get the trash out of the ravine forest. And I'm using ourselves as an example here is that um, just because it, we're nothing extraordinary when it comes to this sort of thing. It looks like we must have planted a few things here. Continue, continually try to remove the, the ivy that comes in or the honeysuckle or gasp, the poison ivy even though it's native. <laughs> we, we have neighbors across the ravine that we could see before everything leafed out and she had, it's a rental house and she has two dogs and the dogs run down to the bottom of the ravine and run back up and I, I can't help but think I sure hope she's not allergic to poison ivy. <laughs> she must not be or I wouldn't be, I don't know that she's got any poison ivy but it's, it's around. So see, these are some of the things, and this is, would be true of whatever you're wanting to plant. Um, you know, the it, dry soil, root competition, not enough organic matter. Um, how many of you have had neighbors that blow every leaf off their property? Yeah. Well, that's not a good way to 
keep your soil up, as you probably all know. Um, soil acidity can be an issue. Um, too much light, too much shade, too many invasives, but that's the way it goes. So I don't really want to harp on this too much, but uh, if, if you really are wanting to grow some of these richer um, co-forest kind of wildflowers, the trilliums, um, foam flower, trout lilies, you really have to usually improve the soils. They want humus rich soil, lots of decomposed leaves. Now, depending, one of the things I really was struck by, and some of you that are newer to this area, is how diverse our soils are. What you have in one part of your landscape is different than another part of your landscape and is probably really different than your friend down the street who has a diff you know is growing other things just because just look at the these lines and the diversity a lot of our our slopes are pretty darn uh, eroded as well um, so we've lost about topsoil in the Piedmont I would joke about how our topsoil had gone down to Charleston Harbor here it's I'm not sure where it's going, but very, very diverse. So knowing where you are in the, the scheme of things is, and, and what your, your property wants to be as a, a, a garden is, is really quite useful, whether you do it just simply by spot by spot or actually look at it. Leave the leaves, that's been a, a big campaign that's come you know, the last few years, not that that was, wasn't always important, but I think it's, a, it's become even more reason to think about as we are worrying about insects, uh, preserving invertebrates that are overwintering in our leaves. And it, you know, it doesn't mean leaving leaves on the crowns of perennials that are trying. I have a pocket meadow in front of our house and I'm thinking, oh no, those, I've got to get those leaves off that um, liatris because they were kind of clogging them. Um, leaves build soil. Leaves are a good thing. You can never have too many leaves, perhaps. Um, Tim liked to go around collecting, when, once we were start asked to bag leaves, he would go around collecting leaves, and of course in my car, but not his, but <laughs> um, he said it was because my car was bigger, but yeah. Um, in any case, all these leaves added to that eroded, vine-filled you know, slope, you could see they start building soil back there. Our house is an infill house in a historic district. So it, it had the weirdest, strangest soil I ever saw in the front. You know, you dug around where I was putting in the pocket meadow perennials, and I'm like, what sort of soil is this? It was something they, it looked like suitable for pottery, you know, clay pots. <laughs> Oops, something happened here, okay. Oops, I don't want to t tell you about creating a, <laughs> a different program. <laughs> Sorry about that, I must have hit the wrong thing. <clears throat> Let me find where I, I was so you don't have to watch me go through all these others. Okay. So, so these, and, and one of actually composted leaves in, are such a great source of nutrients in some cases, depending on the type of leaves, um, adding organic matter, all of these things that break down really rapidly in our relatively warm summer climate. Um, so getting more leaves out there is a good thing. When we ended up, you can see that this is looking out at the same forest with the porch that's popped out over a small studio space below that was an addition between then and now, things are coming along. And from that, 
we're looking at that and it's 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 even more you know so he 2015 that's sort of a not that well reasonably long ago in early spring um, we basically see that saw this last week or so things are changing so it's the forest has coming has come into where we're looking and it's it's been really dramatic the last two weeks you know thinking about giving this program or doing this talk about how much this space has changed I had a friend come over just before she moved to Virginia she said oh it must be so wonderful to look into that forest all the you know you had to have such a nice natural forest and I'm thinking well it is but it, it, there's nothing natural about it it's been <laughs> it's been created back there you know and so we're peering there and going oh yeah look that dogwood's really doing well oh that American beach is doing well um, oh darn that woodchuck ate the flocks <laughs> Man, last spring that woodchuck just mowed all the flocks down. But, but we enjoyed them while we, we had them. So lots of what these yellow, this is the, the golden ragwort we're seeing in the landscape everywhere right now. Um, you can see the hemlock over there. There's, we have probably six or seven in the house, around the house. So just... This was last, mid-June 2020. Um, think about what June 2020 was like. Um, we, I, I, we actually lived part-time up at, in the northern Appalachians in Quebec, which is in a wonderful part of the world. We couldn't go in June of 2020. Border was closed. And so I, we were both, you know, I'm in my studio doing Zoom presentations and things. It made all the difference to look into this forest. It really did. It's beautiful, you know, to, to know. So a recent fall. And so returning, and, and, I, and I, I don't want to underestimate the importance of having landscapes that in your garden or, or vignettes that make you happy right like this the woman I was talking to a couple of days ago one of my main messages is if looking at that plant let's say it's a, a really hideous pink Japanese azalea <laughs> excuse, excuse me if you really love those but um, but something that makes you unhappy to look at Take it out, put in something you love. If something's not thriving, replace it. Um, create views out your window that make you happy or that as you walk to your car or walk into your, your house, make you happy. Native plants and woodlands make me happy, they make Tim happy, so we're both happy to be surrounding ourselves with this and we're busily converting this ornamental a very ornamental landscape in north in the northern Appalachians in a rural area into a much more naturalistic one so this is where the what to add and you've got I didn't print out all my handouts because it just seemed like and I'll show you a link to do the um, printouts for but this this uh, brochure that I know a number of you picked up as you came in has been around for at least 25 years, possibly 30. It is an excellent and fantastic list of native plants to add, not just for your native woodlands, but in general. Um, and learning about these plants, if you aren't already familiar with them, can really help. So, there's also a nice little flyer about some of the local <clears throat> nurseries, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, too. <clears throat> so I'll start with trees. And it, <clears throat> when, you, when we first um, came to the Carolinas, it was relatively hard to find um, native plants in local nurseries. It's still hard 
at regular mainstream nurseries. But increasingly it's possible to buy white oaks and hickories that have long deep root systems and are hard to propagate or keep in containers. Um, tulip poplars, if you have space, the, or yellow poplars, are wonderful, wonderful plants, and I, I almost always recommend them as kind of the backbone of, of some native plant woodland gardens, because they do grow fast. When they're in open sun, they have a really beautiful shape, and they thrive, and you can see from those flowers that they provide an early source of nectar for <clears throat> bumblebees and honeybees. Sweet gums um, can be problematic if you're stepping on the sweet gum balls all the time, but goldfinches love the seeds. They're beautiful. Um, one, of the, one of the trees that's prized in Europe for fall color, uh, um, black gums are increasingly available. American beech, although they are relatively slow growing, are absolutely beautiful trees when they're small too. And I, I'd really recommend uh, them. And you here down on the escarpment, and you see we, there's more beaches here than there are up around Asheville. But it, you'll, they're, they're a wonderful um, tree to have. Sassafras is another great plant. Um, Bear, the lipid-rich berries are great for migrating birds. Um, beautiful fall color. Flower, the, in flower, they're great. Um, it, a little bit more available than they used to be, but they sucker. And so if you have a friend or uh, on your landscape, you can sometimes get you know, just a cutting from an edge. And we've had a, we brought uh, sassafras that had been seeded from our trees in Clemson up to our Asheville landscape. Uh, sourwood, because it's so showy, is quite available. Fraser's magnolia, beautiful native magnolia. There are a number of other um, magnolias that are native to the mountains. Um, cucumber magnolia, umbrella leaf. Um, Try to think of the, some others. <laughs> Our, our southern magnolias uh, are not native to the mountains, but are, are increasingly um, able to tolerate the, the temperatures here. American holly, tons of cultivars of American holly, a shade tolerant, really great, great tree. Other hollies as well, winterberry holly, I don't think I have a picture of those. Red buds, flowering dogwoods, um, they've been a show this year. Amelanchia, um, service berry, I don't think I, yeah, there's Amelanchia. That's a wonderful small tree, native to, to add in the, the um, mid-level canopy. There's silver bell that's in flower right now. As I mentioned, there are several different species. Um, lots of good shrubs, rhododendrons, mountain laurels in our more acidic areas. If you pay really careful attention to slope and drainage, the, they can be just fantastic. They are, however, one of those shrubs, or both are one of those shrubs that can suddenly decide to succumb to root rots and go, I'm done, and you can shuffle them around, but they're wonderful to, and they're used a great deal for a lot of reasons. There's some other, um, Piedmont, is, or Piedmont rhododendron and some other rhododendrons that are good to number of species. <clears throat> I love spice bush, um, partially because it is the host plant for um, spice bush swallowtails, but this, the haze of yellow flowers in the spring, um, then it produces these lipid-rich fruits, fat-rich fruits that support uh, migrating birds as well, just like the sassafras. We, um, pawpaws, if you have a wetter area, are really fun to add. Um, Virginia sweet spire is one that's been around. Mountain laurels, sweet shrub, sparkleberry. You won't, sparkleberry is a little bit hard to find, but mountain laurels are quite widely available, as are sweet shrubs. Witch hazels, our native witch hazel. There's Ozark witch hazels. <coughs> 
And I'll just sort of talk a bit about the, the understory wildflowers. Some are easier than others. You know, sometimes if people think about native or well, make statements like, oh yes, native plants are better adapted to blah, blah, blah. Well, that's true. However, some of these woodland wildflowers are very specific to the type of environment they want to live in. And it's not, you're not going to shove a trillium into a, a dry soil. And if you have deer, don't plant them. <laughs> It's an expensive way to feed deer. <laughs> um, now, foam flowers, they're the, the rhizomatous type, the uh, foam flower are very adaptable and tough. Our woodland violets tend to be very adaptable and tough. Um, both are great. Rue anemone, partridge berry, there's just so many. They're all worth trying in different spots depending on, you know, if you want to have, and I have another program I, I do about, and it's, it's using these native plants in containers, and just imagine how sweet this partridge berry would be mixed together in a container, and it, it really, we have a little patch in front of the house that's really nice. But it's not a vigorous plant, it's not going to take over the world, nor, nor is it easy to get established. Green and gold can be, uh, is a very easy to grow uh, woodland wildflower. Hepatica is a more pip picky one, but quite uh, beautiful if you have a little patch. Um, the, my uh, colleague who still works down at the South Carolina Botanical Garden posted on the garden's um, Facebook feed the other day about a hepatica that had colonized a rock covered with mosses. And she had a beautiful picture of this hepatica that was con colonizing that rock. And I even got goosebumps even telling you about this, but I had a patch of hepatica I watched every year for at least eight years. It was in the same spot, that species. It's the first, one of the very first things to flower in the spring. Very first things to flower in the spring. So it's, and it's very, and it's iconic but it, here and in Europe, a different species. But it, it, made, it, it made me feel really good to think about, wow, maybe that hepatica I admired finally had some offspring out there that colonized that little mossy rock. Um, bloodroot's another one that gets around. Both hepatica and bloodroot ant dispersed. You know, that they have that arrow, fleshy arrow on them that the ants carry off. And you'll see that, I think in recent years, something about the rainfall and temperatures is, is I've seen really big masses of young bloodroot and young um, trout lilies also ant dispersed. So it's, it's good to know that they are spreading in certain places, pretty common. May apples, I think probably, they are all popped up now. They're not quite in flower. Wild gingers, both evergreen and deciduous. Our natives, Allegheny spurge, it's not as fast growing as Japanese spurge, very similar, great plant. Um, very pretty flower. A few ferns, we've got lots of tough ferns, Christmas ferns, southern lady ferns, wood ferns. Um, trout lily, I mentioned just a minute ago. They're not quite as easy to grow, but Virginia bluebells need that pH neutral soil, so that's a good one to, to add, but you have to amend the soil to not be acidic. Most of our soils t tend to be acidic. Um, unless you happen to live above a coal road, or you know, where there was coal. You know, we, we happen to be above an old coal road where the coal was delivered in Monford. And so that particular spot, the pH is elevated. So it, it supports those things. I just wanted to show you these blood roots, blood root seedlings, those little arrows. And one of the things that um, 
I was really happy with is just as we left um, left our house in Clemson, which we really loved our landscape and our old house, our blood roots had spread all over, you know, and they really thrived in the richer soils. You know, this is about the biggest blood root I've ever seen, actually. Um, really big clump. And same thing is happening here in our Asheville landscape where you see the little seedlings and oh there's another blood root oh there's another blood root and you know those ants have been busy out there and and that actually underscores what the point of creating native landscapes or creating the native woodland garden using natives in your landscape the real point is not just because they're beautiful plants and it makes you happy but it's also to reconstruct that w ecosystem web that supports all the different interactions between plants and insects and birds and, um, and water movement and et cetera that's going on out there. And that's again where Doug Tallamy's message about homegrown national park is, is if we can convert our lawn you know, azalea plantings to something more vibrant and supportive of nature, we can then restore um, the functioning of much of our landscapes. And, and I sort of feel like, well, I'll back up. As a young plant ecologist and an academic botanist, I really felt like doing, uh, actually I was a, I did research on weedy species, <laughs> the population biology of weedy species, but um, I turned, I, I got involved with native plant gardening and that turned, that is a message of hope. Restoration of landscape is something that is, we can do. We can add natives to our landscapes, we can add natives to our community centers in front of our um, post offices and and um, in, on, you know, in urban settings, in rural settings, et cetera. It's, a, it's sort of a message of hope. And so, so by turning to being a botanical garden educator, natural history educator, I was connecting people with plants, just, just like I'm doing today as a volunteer. Um, so it's sort of what, so I just encourage you to think more and I hope to inspire you a bit more about um, adding more natives to your landscape. And I'll get, I'm just about done and I'll answer some questions. Um, so here, here are my blood roots popping around, making me happy about that. And aren't, they're so, I love trilliums, but they're a lot more delicate than some plants. I wanted to point out, um, I have actually handouts and a copy of this presentation on my blog, Natural Gardening. Um, and I'll just show you if I can get to it. Well, I, I, it doesn't look like I'd be able to click through, but if you click through to natural gardening, I have archives on the left title bar on the side that you can download any number of things, including this presentation, a species list, a steps to creating a garden. You can get to it both at natural, just Google natural gardening, Lisa Wagner, I think it will pop up. Um, or go, go to my um, site. We had a little trouble with our projection system here, so I, I can't click out. But yeah, if you want, I couldn't. No, that was the end. Yeah, and I can take questions. Let me first say thank you for supporting. Cons